Ah, so I'm going live. It says I'm live. Very dark because there's a window behind me. My friend Lars doesn't like that at all. How was that? Just a little bit of me. Is that okay? Hi, everybody. I'm Kristen. This is Frankenstein Tea, a daily program from the Island Free Library. It is a short story program for adult listeners, and I welcome you. Um, maybe, maybe not the best angle of me, but I'm hoping you can hear me. Maybe I move it a little closer. Um, it's cool here. Uh, this is my kitchen. I am at, at home today. Uh, this is an Island Free Library program, but Monday uh, the library is closed, and so I am home, and uh, I have a kitchen fan that's going, and it's hot today on Block Island. So um, the sun have sort of, has sort of moved past this room. It's heading towards the front of my house. This room is a little cooler right now, and with the fan, it helps. And so... This is the angle you get, this is the view you get, this is who we are today. Um, Frankenstein Tea is, uh, as I said, a short story program for adult listeners and a little bit of a chance for us to check in with each other, perhaps a chance for you to take a time out from whatever your day has presented to you today. Um, maybe you'll listen live with me now, maybe you'll come back to it later, maybe you'll do both, maybe you'll listen to this story twice. Um, I have a little tea. To, I mean, I have a little water today. And as I said, it is hot. Is everybody hot? Boy, it's hot. Ah, okay. So um, I'm going to read from the short stories of Ernest Hemingway today. This has a preface by Ernest Hemingway, which I have spoken about before and said I would read, but again, not today. This book was published by uh, Charles Scribner's, Scribner's Sons. Um, boy, I don't know how to read copyright like that. You know, it started in 1925, then it was 27, 27, 27, 30, 30, 32, 33. 36, 38, renewed in 66 by Mary Hemingway. It's a lot of copyrights. It's a ton of copyrights. You want to see them? It's a lot of copyrights. Um, and I am going to read something I asked my father. I was thinking of him. He might know where this is. I'm not sure. I actually might read two things. Um because one, they kind of come right after each other and I read them both today. I think I am gonna read two things. One is very short, but this is for my mom. Mom, if you're listening, I thought of you. We just, my mother and I both just read Isabel Allende's new book or latest book. Um, and so I thought of her with this because it is uh, about the Spanish uh, Civil War. And so is this short story, or a little, sort of, you know, part of it. Uh, I, I want to say one thing about Isabel Allende's new book. She is a Spanish-speaking, that's her native tongue, or her first tongue, her first language. Not even sure how you say that anymore. And she released uh, her latest novel in Spanish only for a long time. She's one of my favorite authors, and I had to wait. I waited, I think, over a year for her to release that in um, English. Um, and I think that's a really great statement, right? Like this, she released it in Spanish, and, you know, as opposed to translated from the English, it was translated to the English. I liked that. I, don't, I, I didn't like having to wait because I love her. That, that novel is called... Um, the or a, uh, I think it's a, uh, a long petal of the sea. This short story is called Old Man at the Bridge by Ernest Hemingway. An old man with steel rimmed spectacles and very dusty clothes sat by the side of the road. There was a pontoon bridge across the river and carts, trucks, and men, women, and children were crossing it. The mule-drawn cart staggered up the steep bank from the bridge with soldiers helping push against the spokes of the wheels. 
the trucks ground up and away, heading out of it all, and the peasants plodding along in the ankle-deep dust. But the old man sat there without moving. He was too tired to go any farther. It was my business to cross the bridge, explore the bridgehead beyond, and find out to what point the enemy had advanced. I did this and returned over the bridge. There were not so many carts now and very few people on foot, but the old man was still there. Where do you come from? I asked him. From San Carlos, he said and smiled. That was his native town and so it gave him pleasure to mention it and he smiled. I was taking care of animals, he explained. Oh, I said, not quite understanding. Yes, he said, I stayed, you see, taking care of animals. I was the last one to leave the town of San Carlos. He did not look like a shepherd nor a herdsman, and I looked at his black dusty clothes and his gray dusty face and his steel rimmed spectacles and said, what animals were they? Various animals, he said and shook his head. I had to leave them. I was watching the bridge and the African looking country of the Ibra Delta and wondering how long now it would be before we would see the enemy and listening all the while for the first noises that would signal that ever mysterious event called contact. And the old man still sat there. What animals were they? I asked. There were three animals altogether, he explained. There were two goats and a cat, and then there were four pairs of pigeons. And you had to leave them? I asked. Yes, because of the artillery. The captain told me to go because of the artillery. And you have no family? I asked, watching the far end of the bridge where a few last carts were hurrying down the slope of the bank. No, he said. Only the animals, I stated. The cat, of course, will be all right. A cat can look out for itself, but I cannot think what will become of the others. What politics have you? I asked. I am without politics, he said. I am 76 years old. I have come 12 kilometers now, and I think now I can go no further. This is not a good place to stop. I said, if you can make it, there are trucks up the road where it forks for Tortosa. I will wait a while, he said, and then I will go. Where do the trucks go? Towards Barcelona, I told him. I know no one in that direction, he said, but thank you very much. Thank you again very much. He looked at me very blankly and tiredly, then said, having to share his worry with someone, the cat will be all right, I am sure. There is no need to be unquiet about the cat, but the others. Now, what do you think about the others? While they'll probably come through it all right. You think so? Why not? I said, watching the far bank where now there were no carts. But what will they do under the artillery when I was told to leave because of the artillery? Did you leave the dove cage unlocked? I asked. Yes. Then they'll fly. Yes, certainly they'll fly. But the others, it's better not to think about the others, he said. If you are rested, I would go, I urged. Get up and try to walk now. Thank you, he said and got to his feet, swayed from side to side and then sat down backwards in the dust. I was taking care of animals, he said dully, but no longer to me. I was only taking care of animals. There was nothing to do about him. It was Easter Sunday and the fascists were advancing toward the Ebro. It was a gray overcast day with a low ceiling, so their planes were not up. That and the fact that cats know how to look after themselves was all the good luck that old man would ever have.
Old Man at the Bridge by Ernest Hemingway. This one is called Up in Michigan. John Gilmore came to Horton's Bay from Canada. He bought the blacksmith shop from Old Man Horton. Jim was short and dark with big mustaches and big hands. He was a good horseshoer and did not look much like a blacksmith, even with his leather apron on. He lived upstairs above the blacksmith shop and took his meals at DJ Smith's. Liz Coates worked for Smith's. Mrs. Smith, who was, very, who was a very large, clean woman, said Liz Coates was the neatest girl she'd ever seen. Liz had good legs and always wore clean gingham aprons, and Jim noticed that her hair was always neat behind. He liked her face because it was so jolly, but he never thought about her. Liz liked Jim very much. She liked it the way he walked over from the shop and often went to the kitchen door to watch for him to start down the road. She liked it about his mustache. She liked it about how white his teeth were when he smiled. She liked it very much that he didn't look like a blacksmith. She liked it how much DJ Smith and Mrs. Smith liked Jim. One day she found that she liked it the way the hair was black on his arms and how white they were above the tanned line when he washed up in the wash, wash basin outside the house. Liking that made her feel funny. Horton's Bay, the town, was only five houses on the main road between Boyne City and Charlevoix. There was the general store and post office with a high false front and maybe a wagon hitched out in front. Smith's house, Strode's house, Dilworth's house, Horton's house, and Van Hoosen's house. The houses were in a big grove of elm trees and the road was very sandy. There, were, there was farming country and timber each way up the road. Up the road a ways was the Methodist church and down the road the other direction was the township school. The blacksmith shop was painted red and faced the school. A steep sandy road ran down the hill to the bay through the timber. From Smith's back door, you could look out across the woods that ran down to the lake and across the bay. It was very beautiful in the spring and summer. The bay blue and bright and usually white caps on the lake out beyond the point from the breeze blowing from Charlevoix and Lake Michigan. From Smith's back door, Liz could see ore barges way out in the lake going toward Boyne City. When she looked at them, they didn't seem to be moving at all. But if she went in and dried some more dishes and then came out again, they would be out of sight beyond the point. All the time now, Liz was thinking about Jim Gilmore. He didn't seem to notice her much. He talked about the shop to DJ Smith and about the Republican Party and about James G. Blaine. In the evenings, he read the Toledo Blade and the Grand Rapids paper by the lamp in the front room or went out spear, spearing fish in the bay with a jacklight with DJ Smith. In the fall, he and Smith and Charlie Wyman took a wagon and tent grub, axes, their rifles, and two dogs, and went on a trip to the Pine Plains beyond Vanderbilt deer hunting. Liz and Mrs. Smith were cooking for four days for them before they started. Liz wanted to make something special for Jim to take, but she didn't, finally, because she was afraid to ask Mrs. Smith for the eggs and flour, and afraid if she bought them, Mrs. Smith would catch her cooking. It would have been all right with Mrs. Smith, but Liz was afraid. All the time Jim was gone on the deer hunting trip, Liz thought about him. It was awful while he was gone. She couldn't sleep well from thinking about him, but she discovered it was fun to think about him too. If she let herself go, it was better. The night before they were to come back, she didn't sleep at all. 
That is, she didn't think she slept because it was all mixed up in a dream about not sleeping and really not sleeping. When she saw the wagon coming down the road, she felt weak and sort and sick sort of inside. She couldn't wait till she saw Jim and it seemed as though everything would be all right when he came. The wagon stopped outside under the big elm and Mrs. Smith and Liz went out. All the men had beards and there were three deer in the back of the wagon, their thin legs sticking stiff over the edge of the wagon box. Mrs. Smith kissed DJ and he hugged her. Jim said, hello, Liz, and grinned. Liz hadn't known just what would happen when Jim got back, but she was sure it would be something. Nothing had happened. The men were just home and that was all. Jim pulled the burlap sacks off the deer and Liz looked at them. One was a big buck. It was stiff and hard to lift out of the wagon. Did you shoot it, Jim? Liz asked. Yeah, ain't it a beauty? Jim got it into his, onto his back to carry to the smokehouse. That night, Charlie Wyman stayed to supper at Smith's. It was too late to get back to Charlevoix. The men washed up and waited in the front room for supper. Ain't there something left in that crock, Jimmy? DJ Smith asked. And Jim went out to the wagon in the barn and fetched in the jug of whiskey the men had, been ta had taken hunting with them. It was a four gallon jug and there was quite a little slopped back and forth in the bottom. Jim took a long pull on his way back to the house. It was hard to lift such a big jug up, jug up to drink out of it. Some of the whiskey ran down on his shirt front. The two men smiled when Jim came in with the jug. DJ Smith sent for glasses and Liz brought them. DJ poured out three big shots. Well, here's looking at you, DJ, said Charlie Wyman. That damn big buck, Jimmy, said DJ. Here's all the ones we missed, DJ, said Jim, and downed his liquor. Tastes good to a man. Nothing like it at this time of year for what ails you. How about another, boys? Here's how, DJ. Down the creek, boys. Here's to next year. Jim began to feel great. He loved the taste and the feel of whiskey. He was glad to be back to a comfortable bed and warm food and the shop. He had another drink. The men came in to supper feeling hilarious but acting very respectable. Liz sat at the table after she put on the food and ate with the family. It was a good dinner. The men ate seriously. After supper, they went into the front room again and Liz cleaned off with Mrs. Smith. Then Mrs. Smith went upstairs and pretty soon Smith came out and went upstairs too. Jim and Charlie were still in the front room. Liz was sitting in the kitchen next to the stove pretending to read a book and thinking about Jim. She didn't want to go to bed yet because she knew Jim would be coming out and she wanted to see him as he went out so she could take the way he looked up to bed with her. She was thinking about him hard and then Jim came out. His eyes were shining and his hair was a little rumpled. Liz looked down at her book. Jim came over back of her chair and stood there and she could feel him breathing and then he put his arms around her. Her breasts felt plump and firm and the nipples were erect under his hands. Liz was terribly frightened. No one had ever touched her, but she thought, he's come to me finally. He's really come. She held herself stiff because she was so frightened and did not know anything else to do. And then Jim held her tight against the chair and kissed her. It was such a sharp, aching, hurting feeling that she thought she couldn't stand it. She felt Jim right through the back of the chair and she couldn't stand it. And then something clicked inside of her and the feeling was warmer and softer. 
Jim held her tight hard against the chair and she wanted it now. And Jim whispered, come on for a walk. Liz took her coat off the peg on the kitchen wall and they went out the door. Jim had his arm around her and every little way they stopped and pressed against each other and Jim kissed her. There was no moon and they walked ankle deep in the sandy road through the trees down to the dock and the warehouse on the bay. The water was lapping in the piles and the point was dark across the bay. It was cold, but Liz was hot all over from being with Jim. They sat down in the shelter of the warehouse and Jim pulled Liz close to him. She was frightened. One of Jim's hands went inside her dress and stroked over her breast and the other hand was in her lap. She was very frightened and didn't know how he was going to go about things, but she snuggled close to him. Then the hand that felt so big in her lap went away and was on her leg and started to move up it. Don't, Jim, Liz said. Jim slid the hand further up. You mustn't, Jim, you mustn't. Neither Jim nor Jim's big hand paid any attention to her. The boards were hard. Jim had her dress up and was trying to do something to her. She was frightened, but she wanted it. She had to have it, but it frightened her. You mustn't do it, Jim. You mustn't. I got to. I'm going to. You know we got to. No, we haven't, Jim. We ain't got to. Oh, it isn't right. Oh, it's so big and it hurts so. You can't. Oh, Jim. Jim, oh. The hemlock planks of the dark were hard and splintery and cold, and Jim was heavy on her, and he had hurt her. Liz pushed him. She was so uncomfortable and cramped. Jim was asleep. He wouldn't move. She worked out from under him and sat up and straightened her skirt and coat and tried to do something with her hair. Jim was sleeping with his mouth a little open. Liz leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. He was still asleep. She lifted his head a little and shook it. He rolled his head over and swallowed. Liz started to cry. She walked over to the edge of the dock and looked down to the water. There was a mist coming up from the bay. She was cold and miserable and everything felt gone. She walked back to where Jim was lying and shook him once more to make sure. She was crying. Jim, she said, Jim, please, Jim. Jim stirred and curled a little tighter. Liz took off her coat and leaned over and covered him with it. She tucked it around him neatly and carefully. Then she walked across the dock and up the steep sandy road to go to bed. A cold mist was coming up through the woods from the bay. Ernest Hemingway, that short story is called Up in Michigan. The one before was Old Man at the Bridge. I, so I don't usually sit here, as anyone who watches Frankenstein Tea might know, um, but there I was sitting by my stove reading a book. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed those two stories. I'm thinking of you all. Library opens for outdoor library service tomorrow at 10 a.m. We'll be back at it for another week of outdoor library service. Um, you know, our new tagline, meeting all your library needs safely and efficiently. Have a great afternoon. Stay cool. Drink lots of water. Mom, are you listening? Drink water. Look at the wind by, see the, see my hair blowing? It really, this is a nice little spot. I may sit right here and continue reading. Be well, everyone. Wear your mask, wash your hands, stay safe. Go in peace.